Hey everybody, Alex Kazora, SteelersDepot.com, back with some Pittsburgh Steelers tape breakdown and analysis. Today I want to talk about Matt Canada, everyone's favorite OC. No, uh, the calls for Matt Canada's firing have been um, as heavy as ever, especially in lieu of Mike Tomlin's comments that did not guarantee but implied and strongly hinted that Canada will return as the Steelers OC in 2022. I'll be honest, and I can explain this probably more in a in a different video. You can hear it on on the terrible podcast. I kind of gave my thoughts during uh, Wednesday's show. I'm not in the pitchfork camp of Fire Canada today. Now, by no means did the Steelers' offense have a, su- a successful season. It was bad. It was terrible. Canada certainly shares in some of that blame. He is the OC after all. Um, but I'm not as fervent about got to fire him today, have to fire him. It's a travesty if he remains the OC into next year. But for those who do not like Matt Canada, you will like this video because I think if there's one tangible, more concrete criticism of him, it's him losing that chess game where he's calling things based on looks he thinks he's going to get but doesn't ultimately get. And I'll explain that in this video today with several examples. Um, And I've shown some of these before in past videos, Um, some I haven't but it's just good to kind of put it all in one place. Now, before I start showing all these clips, one caveat, I understand as an OC, you're calling over a thousand plays in a season. You're not going to get it right every single time. Defenses are good. They got good coaches. They're going to win some of those battles. That's a chess game. But I just thought overall, this was a recurring theme with Canada in my evaluation and tape watching throughout the year. And it makes sense as him being a first year OC, he might struggle a bit in this regard against more veteran defensive coordinator. So first example here comes against Green Bay, and you're going to see a a mesh concept here with a nasty reduced split here with Juju and James Washington. It's against man coverage. It works. Ultimately, Ben does not throw there. He takes a deep shot to Deontay Johnson. That falls incomplete, but underneath, you can see the mesh concept work. And so this is, by the way, down in distance, very important here in play calling. This is going to be a third and four on Green Bay's 32. So third and four, 32-yard line. They're getting man coverage. Mesh works. Does not get completed, but that's not on Canada. Um, But that's just keep that in mind for the next play. A little bit later in that Packers game, fourth and five at Green Bay's 47. Big down here, Pittsburgh down 27 10 if they want any any chance to come back in this game. They they have to convert here. So Matt Canada, knowing he got man coverage before, thinks he's going to get man coverage again because it's a similar down distance and a relatively similar position on the field. So again, he's going to call this mesh concept. But unfortunately, he gets zoned instead of man. And that's the Packers being one step ahead. They're not going to roll the same coverage in a similar situation. They're going to mix things up. They're going to roll in the zone coverage. So the mesh concept does not work. And Juju's tackled well short of the sticks. And um, again, I understand there's always man beaters and zone beaters. But this is primarily a a cover or call you're making because you're expecting man coverage. That mesh concept's the primary read, the first progression. Um, and you're doing this because you're thinking you're going to get man-to-man. You get zone on this play, and the Steelers turn the ball over on downs. Let's fast forward to the Tennessee Titans game, third and eight here on the Steelers' first drive of the game, and I'll play this one through. And then again, we're comparing and, and contrasting a play that's called earlier versus one that's called later. Pittsburgh running, uh, whatever you want to call it. They're kind of a smash concept. We're in the corner, the slant underneath smashes curl corner, but it's the same idea, basically, and they get man coverage on this play. Again, Ben throwing to Claypool on the other side. The pass is incomplete. Don't love the decision there from Ben, um, but just focus on the concept at the bottom. Getting man coverage, Deontay beats that. Would have been open. Would have caught this pass if Ben hit him, and so Canada sees that, obviously, upstairs in the booth on third and eight. Next drive for Pittsburgh, they're facing a third and 10, so similar situation here, and it's a different personnel grouping, it's 11 personnel this time, but the same concept. You're going to get the corner route by the number two receiver with Deontay running underneath underneath on the slant, hoping and expecting to get man coverage. Just like the Packers game, though, you get zone this time, and so the throw to Deontay, he doesn't have the corner beat because it's zone coverage, the corner's uh, passing that one off to the middle of the field, and Deontay has nowhere to go. And they swarm because, again, these are zone droppers, they're not man droppers, and they're getting eyes on the football, and Deontay cannot convert on 3rd and 10. So had they gotten man coverage 3rd and 10, like the first example, Deontay, because he's got the great release, has a chance to pick that up. But again, zone coverage, he has no chance. And so again, Canada calling this because he thinks he's getting man, similar down-distance situation, um, you know, line of scrimmage as the first example on the first drive, 
Tennessee one step ahead. They're going to play zone this time, and they're going to make the stop. Slightly different example here that does have a positive outcome. This is the fourth and eight play in overtime against Baltimore, a really key conversion by Ray Ray McLeod. And so there's no compare and contrast here, but Ben had said after the game that they called this play to hit Pat Frymuth on an in-cut. And to be fair, according to Ben, Frymuth said, you know, let me run the in-cut. He had run an out route, caught it on third down earlier in this drive. He said, you know, they're playing me out. Let me run the in. But ultimately, Matt Canada made that call, and Ben said they got the worst look possible because the primary uh, receiver here is Pat Frymuth. It, but the linebacker here drops out and has inside leverage, and so the in cut here by Fr- by Frymuth is not available. And of course, Ben, they go to a second read. So that just kind of goes back to the idea of you're getting a different look than what you wanted. Um, and again, I understand that's going to happen over the course of a season. But it felt like it happened too often, and especially on 4th and eight. I mean, to not get the look that you want really put yourself in a tight spot. And Pittsburgh, frankly, pretty lucky they completed this pass. Ray Ray made a, a good catch on a pass that was a little bit short, and uh, he made the play. But again, just going back to the idea of what you were hoping to get post-snap, you did not. And that puts your offense, which is not potent by any means, in a pretty tough spot. So watch this play through, and then go to the next examples. This is from Sunday's wildcard loss to the Chiefs' back-to-back plays we're going to look at. And last week, I showed Deontay Johnson's return whip routes that were effective. And to Canada's credit, he called those in good situations against man coverage. Um, And Deontay won, as he tends to do in those moments. So you're running those return whip routes to try to beat man coverage. They're not zone beaters. So second and six here, and Juju's going to run that return whip where it looks like he's going to, and I'll just run the whole thing through here, kind of sit down on a curl and then start to run away. Kind of that return to the outside route but this is not man coverage so it's not going to beat man coverage it's zone coverage here and uh, you know there's, there's no gain on this play the corner max easily able to make this tackle um at least needs there initially and then you know casey swarms and wraps up and this becomes third and six so i can only assume here you're running this route to because you're thinking you're going to get man coverage the first progression on this on the play on this return route and uh it goes nowhere so the very next play, third and six here in this game, and Chase Claypool is going to run the return route. Now, to be fair, they are, Juju runs the return route to the bottom, and they're playing man coverage, at least it appears, or maybe a zone match coverage, um, to the bottom here. But Claypool is running this return route to the top. It's against zone coverage here to the top, and so this cornerback's not getting full because he's passing this off here to Sorensen, who's coming down trying to cut that. And then as Claypool runs back out, the cornerback just comes down. They swarm, and Claypool short of the stick. So... Um, again, first progression here, Claypool isolated, one by, uh, three by one formation. Here's the X receiver. They wanted band coverage. They wanted Claypool to win that matchup 1v1. And because they got zone coverage, this play really has no chance here to work despite Claypool's effort. And uh, they're not going to give him forward progress there and that kind of little skirmish there at the end. So um, just a kind of a collection and a thought that's been in my head throughout the season. And again, you can probably look at a lot of coaches and say, you know, you're not going to get every single look that you were hoping for every single time. So that's probably a a criticism back at this video. Um, I just wanted to show this again, not because I'm in the fire Canada today camp, although this is not a, obviously a a glowing uh, praise of his coordinating abilities, but I wanted to at least offer something that was like concrete and tangible about why Canada struggled as a first year OC, as opposed to just saying, Oh, the offense was bad or the play calling was predictable, or the dreaded run-run pass. And some of those things have, you know, kernels of truth to them, but it's not specific. I mean, it's hard to fire a coach or really evaluate a coach in these very broad, vague terms. Um, and coaching goes multiple layers and what you do to prepare prepare and stuff like that. Things we don't see, that's hard for us to evaluate. But from an on-field perspective, I wanted to offer something where at the very least you would say things that hopefully will get better for next year. And I think they probably will, assuming Canada returns, um, when you're a more experienced OC and um, things like that. But I think from a scouting aspect, Pittsburgh probably has to do a better job of um, you know, not losing those matchups pre-snap. So there you go. A criticism of Matt Canada. Be sure to share this with all your friends and people that hate the guy and think he should get fired. This one will probably make them very happy. Um, again, I'm not 100% in that camp. I wouldn't be terribly upset if they let him go, but I'm not going to be horribly upset if he returns either, and that's where things seem to be trending as of at least January 20th. So let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Appreciate you guys watching. Please like and subscribe if you have not done so already, and we'll talk to you soon.